All right, everyone. Well, well, thank you so much. And if we got if we got the feeling, the essence of that treatment, then we already have the essence of of what we want to talk about this morning. And this is Dr. Holmes' uh, chapter in a textbook on immortality. It's chapter 23. And I think it's most important that we consider this from time to time, uh, not only you know to, to answer one of the key questions in life, who am I, why am I here, where am I going, are the three big questions in life. And a discussion of immortality certainly helps us to, to consider the answer to the last question, but more importantly, it helps us to understand what we are already here and now and to live our lives as those magnificent spiritual beings that we truly are you know it's sort of you know we we get it through we get it through fables we get it through fairy tales we get it we get it through through many many different ways of teaching that we don't really know what we are it's like the ugly duckling you know we're kind of judging ourselves by by the collective consciousness around us, by, <clears throat> by everybody's attitude around us, by the opinions of the world. And here we are, this beautiful swan, this beautiful swan that is just waiting to emerge, it's just waiting to discover itself. But yet we're held back by our own limiting beliefs. For those of you who who lived through the 60s and, and thereabouts, you might remember uh, Richard Box, uh, Jonathan Living Seagull. And Jonathan Living Seagull. And we had to read that as, as a kid. We read that in high school. And it was, such a, it was such an inspiring book for a young teenager because there it was telling us, you know, that, that we're all like Jonathan Livingston Seagull. We're all, we all just had this magnificent ability that, that we just are waiting to discover and yet the rest of the flock is is holding us back with their ideas of course we're allowing ourselves to be hold back held back but the rest of the flock is is trying to keep the mediocrity in place and and Jonathan Livingston Seagull which was each and every one of us just wants to fly just wants to soar just wants to break through the limiting barriers of consciousness that culture and society have created and that's why it's important to to really consider, you know, what are we? What is this thing called immortality? What happens when the body dies? Where do we go? Do we come back? Do we go someplace else? All these different things. And Dr. Holmes does, a, does I believe, a, a very good job in laying out in this chapter very clearly his views on these topics and also why they are so important. And he starts right out. He starts right out with saying, be- before we can discuss this idea, this idea of being immortality, we probably need to define what it is. You know, because there's so many different, there's so many different uh, interpretations around the world. There's so many different ways uh, of looking things, looking at things. And and what we know, what human society knows, what our culture knows is largely based on experience, physical experience. And we form opinions and and beliefs based on the experience. If something happens, there's an event, something happens, and we tend to try to identify cause associated with that event. And it, it could be something that just was simultaneous, something that was coincidental, something that just seemed to happen at the same time. But... But nevertheless, we start to assign cause. We, we're always trying to figure out how the world works, and we're trying to, to then make the world fit our preconceived notion of how it works. And an interesting example of this is if you look at the world religions that originated in the dry, arid regions, the, the deserts of the Middle East, if you look at Judaism and Christianity and Islam, the, the religions of the book, um, they're called, because they all go back to, uh, to Abraham. They have a, a worldview that is, um, is, 
sees the world as harsh. It's a tough place. It's a tough place to make a living in the desert. It's it's tough to grow your food in the desert. You know, you have to you have to eat your food by the sweat of your brow. You suffer in the heat. Shadow is a welcome refuge, and that's why shadows are used uh, used in in the uh, poetic language of of the uh, of the Middle East to represent the protection of God. You know, he who abides in the shadow of of the he who yeah he who dwells in the house consciousness of God abides in the shadow of the Almighty. So we get from these cultures a very, very uh, unique view of God, and God is God is kind of like a, an Oriental king, if you will, kind of like a, a Middle Eastern ruler who has friends, who has enemies, who has who has good days and bad, who has mood swings. And life is a struggle. You see, life is a test. Life is something that you you've got to you've got to survive long enough to pass the test. But oh my goodness! Once once you pass the test, see once once you leave the the environment of the struggle, once once your body gives up the ghost, well then you know then you can move into a better experience. You can move into a heaven or a paradise, or uh, in some cultures into a waiting place where you just kind of sleep. Uh, sleep forever until until it's time for everybody to wake up and all these different ideas about immortality come to us from from this harsh environment but if you move over into different environments if you move into the lush tropical environments whether they be uh, in India which gave us Hinduism and Buddhism or if you move into uh, the southern Pacific Islands you know and you look at the the religious beliefs of people who grew up in a in a very uh, lush environment, a very supporting environment, where it wasn't necessarily a struggle to live. You know that that if you wanted to lunch, you just went out into the into the forest and and uh, you picked some fruit. If you wanted fish, you went down to the lagoon and and you you caught a fish. And these people developed a totally different concept of God. See, the, the, the creator in these cultures or the concept of God in these cultures was not uh, an adversarial relationship, not a, a punishing relationship, not, not a test. Life was not a test that we needed to pass or fail. But it was rather something that, that we are an integral part of, something, something that we... We exist in it, and it exists in us. So in those environments, if if a tree fell, for example, in the jungle, what would happen is many trees would would come out of the of the, little shoots would come out of the fallen tree trunk. If a if a <coughs> seeds were planted in a drunk jungle, many 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 more plants would come up out of the ground and in those environments life was so rich and so nourishing that the concept of of death being an end to something did not exist as much as as death being a change where in that change a greater expression of life came to be one tree falls and ten trees grow kind of a thing and people would see life not necessarily in in the constraints of one physical body that lived for a period of less than a hundred years but they would just see life as something that is it just simply is and our ideas of immortality then kind of get shaped by these different world views you know in in the the western world our science as we talked a couple of weeks ago our science is based in uh, materialism which is nothing wrong with that but materialism will say that you know everything that is can be explained in terms of of you know processes that exist within matter chemical processes within matter electrical processes within matter but everything has its root in matter or material so so our our world view in the western world is not only shaped by these ideas that come from from a harsh environment which kind of perceiving us as as humanity against nature 
but but also we see ourselves as sort of victims of matter. Matter creates life out of itself somehow. Matter creates life out of itself, whether whether comets come and and cause a great explosion that causes chemical reactions that form the building blocks of life, or they actually carry some some kind of seed of life from a faraway place, or wh- whatever the concept may be, it all comes back down to this belief in matter. And of course, once the matter starts to to decay, once the matter starts to go back into energy, right? Because energy becomes matter and it stays in form for a while and then it goes back into energy. And in that materialistic way of thinking, then, you know, life itself is nothing more than <clears throat> chemical reactions. Life itself is, is nothing more than, <clears throat> than the, the sum total uh, of these chemical reactions. The definition of consciousness in that worldview <clears throat> is that consciousness is the sum total of the electrical and chemical impulses of the brain. And out of these different worldviews, we get different ideas of what what this thing that we might call immortality is. In a materialistic <clears throat> view, it's non-existent. When the matter of the brain stops working, why then it can no longer create consciousness, and then everything that we knew <clears throat> to be about ourselves, our memory, our perceptions, uh, our feelings, our personality, all those things just cease to exist because they were merely projections of chemical activity in the brain. So in the materialistic view, then immortality uh, doesn't exist at all. The universe comes, the universe goes, we come, we go, but nothing nothing lasts forever. <clears throat> and there is no memory and that carries forward. In other cultures, the, the idea of immortality is, is that life continues to exist, but the, the individual personality of <clears throat> what you and I might be, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't exist forever, that, that it comes into being for a while, life expresses itself as us for a while, and then when the body dies, that that unique individualized thing that, that you know as you and I just ceases to exist, but somehow folds back into this greater, uh, this greater expression of life. And you have all kinds of ideas in, in between. You know, in between the two, you have you have all kinds of ideas that uh, the individual personality persists after death. Uh, but the individual personality in the environments, in, in the r- cultures where where people grew up in a harsh environment and life is a test, well, now that individual personality has to undergo some kind of a trial, you know, some kind of a test, some kind of a judgment to see how it's going to spend uh, eternity. Is it going to spend eternity, if you will, in a heaven or in a hell? Is it going to be rewarded for being good or is it going to be punished uh, for being bad? Those kind of things. So all of these different ideas start to uh, to creep in. There's, there's, some, there's some ideas, if you will, that a part of the consciousness uh, exists but maybe the unique uh, individualized personality that we were, uh, you know, stops existing. But but some part of us continues to exist, and that part of us then uh, comes back, and it comes back to be reborn into a, into another body with another personality. But the essence of the personalities might remain the same. So you have all these different ideas to sort through. And Dr. Holmes says, so we need to be clear up front what we're talking about, or what he's talking about in this chapter. And he starts off by by very simply stating what he's talking about is that our ability to to know, to perceive, and our ability to remember our memories and our unique personality persists. That these things are the unique individualized expression of God as us, and they are not functions of the body, but rather the body is functions of, of them and that when the body is no longer a suitable vehicle for our soul that is our unique individualized 
personality, our unique individualized expression of God, when that body no longer serves its purpose through, through sickness, you know, through accident, so <clears throat> that what happens is our personality, our memories, our knowing, our perception continue to exist. Therefore, we continue to exist, albeit in a different state than we have we currently understand on this place, in this planet Earth. But nevertheless, we continue to exist. And that's what he means by immortality. And he goes on to tell us, if you, if you stop and think about the materialist uh, way of thinking, the idea that you know, consciousness is a function of the brain, uh, he, he turns around and he says, no, you have to realize that the brain is really an instrument of consciousness, a function of consciousness. That if you take the thinker away, the brain doesn't continue to think on its own. That there is a thinker thinking through the brain. That there is a thinker using the brain. And as I as I said a couple weeks ago when we were reviewing, uh, you know, quantum physics in in our Skype group, we found some lectures on the internet of uh, of physicists, you know, theoretical physicists, talking in terms that you would think they were <clears throat> they were a Hindu philosopher, and they were talking about how it is a tension in consciousness that starts the chemical reaction, the electrochemical reactions in the brain that we, we can monitor on, uh, on scanners. So if you want to think about peace, for example, a certain part of your brain will light up. But the, the thing that started that ball rolling, the intention of, of experiencing peace was something that took place not as a chemical reaction in the brain, but it caused the chemical reactions in the brain. So Dr. Holmes tells us that we must understand, we must come to realize that we, we, what we perceive ourselves to be, what we are, is the thinker thinking through the brain. It is, it is the doer acting through the body. It is the soul using this body while we are here on this earth to express our life perfectly in a vehicle that is entirely appropriate for this place, for this time. We have lungs and we have air. We, we, our bodies are perfect for this place and for this time. You know, we have thirst and we have water. We have food. We have all of these things that are just absolutely perfect for us existing here in this place at this time. But when it is appropriate for us to leave, we must consider that wherever we go, we will also be perfectly clothed in whatever form is appropriate for our new environment. So Dr. Holmes tells us that consciousness must always cloak itself in form. If you step back far enough and think about it, the universe that we see, and, and if you include in that, as I said in the opening treatment, the universe that we can't see, because right? scientists now you know, know that there's stuff there that we can't see. It's there, but we can't see it. And you have all, all of this that is, that is there, and that is spirit, God, cloaking itself in form. Because... <clears throat> Dr. Holmes is telling us that in order for consciousness to be aware, it has to be aware of something. And the form is the perfect outpicturing of the consciousness so that it can be aware of itself. So to that end, what he's telling us is that consciousness will always, always cloak itself in whatever form as may be appropriate for whatever environment it is going to function in. Now we can talk about what we are, we can talk about us being a unique individualized expression of that one life of God. 
But he also tells us we will never know why, why life is. He says, he says almost tongue-in-cheek, he says, even God does, could not explain why God is. I had to think about that when I read it. Even God couldn't explain why God is. Because life just is. It just is. God is the great I am. This is the Old Testament's highest name for God, I am. We can't say any more about it. I am. It is. God is. So if we think about our own <clears throat> lives and our own self, pretty much all we can eventually get to is to say, I am. Now we might say, I am because God is. And that would be true because we did not create these lives that we live. But the one life created the lives that we live out of itself. So we will never really know why. Why? We can say that, that life has created us out of itself to enjoy itself. Life has created itself, created us out of itself to express itself. But really, all we know is God is. And God is as us. And once we really get that, that that which we think we are is some part of the one infinite life expressing itself as us, then it becomes remarkably clear that it was never born and it shall never die and it is immortal and it is conscious it is aware it knows and therefore it as us will remain conscious will remain aware will remain a knower and a perceiver forever and ever and ever and that when we when we leave this place here so what happens is we don't end but this world as we know it ends but we the unique individualized expression of God that we are we continue to have our identity. We continue to know who we are. We continue to be cloaked in whatever form as may be appropriate, whatever body as may be appropriate for our new environment. We can see and recognize those around us, those who have gone before us. We can communicate and we can do all of the things that we need to do in order to keep evolving our soul, to keep evolving our awareness of the presence of God within. Remember I keep saying that what our spiritual path is, what our spiritual journey is, we're just simply trying to remember who we are, what we are. We're just simply trying to learn to love ourselves and my definition of love is the experience of oneness that I got from Osho. The experience of unity. We are trying to learn to love ourselves by remembering that we are part of that one. <clears throat> the great oneness. The great I am. And we will never, we will never get to experience all of it. but as much of it as we can experience 
encompasses our, our place in spiritual growth at any point in time. So our awareness of God, our awareness of God as us, continues to unfold, continues to evolve forever and forever and forever. And we will always be in the perfect environment and in the perfect body within that environment for our spiritual growth, for our continued unfoldment. And Dr. Holmes tells us when he, when he describes immortality and he describes the fact that our soul will always be cloaked in form, always be cloaked in some type of a body. He says it's not, it's not like something that you're going to get down the road. It's already here. <clears throat> it's already here within this physical body that we use right now. That there are bodies within bodies within bodies within bodies. And they're all here and they're all now and they're all present, but we don't, we don't necessarily see them all right now. We don't necessarily see them all. And this is not far, as far-fetched as, as it may sound. You know, how can, two, how can two things be in the same place at the same time? Where we've, we've grown up in, in, in the world where, you know, two things just can't be in the same place at the same time. And as I said the other week, of course, that comes to us from from Greek logic. You know, Greek logic says it, it is something either is or isn't, but it can't be both is and isn't, or neither is nor isn't. Uh, in Indian philosophy, it can. And now, what we're finding out as as science takes us deeper and deeper into discovering s- subatomic particles. We discover the vast amount of space that that exists within the atoms and there's there's so much space in there that other things can actually pass right through without even interfering with them there are particles now that uh, scientists are, are are looking for that we we have <clears throat> some kind of neutrinos that pass through us all the time and we have c- complete lack of awareness of them but they're there and they pass through us as if we weren't even here as if we were invisible and as you start to get deeper and deeper into the, into some of the exploration of of the quantum mechanics which I don't even pretend to understand it's it's just boggles my mind but the little bit that I do understand is is that now they are are discovering that there are uh, there are the subatomic particles called quarks which which make up the basic uh, the basic building blocks that we came to know as uh, protons and neutrons and electrons and there are three different kinds of these quarks but we can only see one one kind that there are two different kinds of quarks that logic and reason tell sciences are there but logic and reason tell them that they will never have the capability of weighing or measuring or seeing so now we're starting to come to the realization uh, you know of some of some of the things that <clears throat> that ancients have been <laughs> been kind of talking about you know that, that everything that we see is not everything that is there that there are things that are unseen that there are universes within universes, perhaps, multiverses. They start to talk about things called string theory, which, which again, I, you know, I don't know that, that, that they understand it, much less me understand it, but it brings out the concept of parallel universes. You, you look into you know, how, how particles react down at the quantum level and they may or may not be there. And there may or may not be other particles that we don't know yet and we don't see yet. So it is entirely possible then that at a physical level, and remember what we're talking about with physical level, that we're only talking about energy that is temporarily taking form. 
energy comes into into form it becomes matter on a temporary basis and it goes back into energy and it comes back into matter and it goes back into energy and it goes back into matter and this energy is functioning at many different levels and it is taking form at many different levels in many different ways that you know we're only beginning to understand so it's entirely possible then what Dr. Holmes is telling us that we already have our next body. It is already right here. It is already a body within a body. And that when the moment of death comes, it's no, it's no more difficult than taking off your coat and stepping out of it. Now what this means, what we really have to get our mind around, is that it does it means that we are not going to become immortal it means that we already are immortal we already are spiritual beings we already are a soul that is cloaked in the appropriate form that we call our body to function in this world. It's already here. Already here. Already now. The bodies that we have now are constantly changing. Old cells are dying off. New cells are being born. And what is it that controls those cells? What is it that has those cells form themselves into the appropriate organ or tissue or bone or function of our body but there is a consciousness an overriding consciousness that is controlling that growth and that development perfectly so we are already immortal you and i have already outlived many many bodies while we were here on this earth and we will continue to outlive many many bodies as long as we exist here on this earth. So letting go of our body is something that we have been doing since the time we were born. And we never gave it a second thought. We never worried about it. We never considered it. It just occurred so naturally to us. So that consciousness that we are, that knows how to cloak our soul, our unique individualized personality in the appropriate form knows how to do that when we get ready to move to the next plane of existence. So what Dr. Holmes is telling us is, is that once we recognize, once we truly come to grasp this idea that we are already immortal, then we never have to worry again about what happens when we die. Because there is no such thing as death. There is only the putting off of one form and the emerging of another form which was already cloaking our soul and ready to spring into action when it became necessary for us and appropriate for us to leave here so that we could go to the next place for the unfoldment of our soul. Dr. Holmes tells us his personal views on reincarnation is that we wouldn't come back here. He says that the universe is just too big <laughs> and life is too varied and there's no two snowflakes or fingerprints alike that he couldn't imagine why we would come back and do the same experience over and over again. That it would be more in line with his thinking that we move on to a new place and to a new experience, but still surrounded with people that we will know and people that we will, we will build relationships with and people that we will love. Now, he doesn't say it in this chapter, but he says it in other, in other writings of his that I have read. He said... <clears throat> But if we do come back here, he would be pleasantly surprised, and it doesn't change a thing because our purpose, if you will, is still the unfoldment of our soul, the growth of our soul, the discovery of who and what we truly are. 
So what we want to consider then is rather than than living our lives the way that culture has conditioned us to think, which is, you know, basically you have to you have to live your life as a mortal human being until you die and then somehow magically you become the spiritual being. What we have to do is bring ourselves into the realization that what we are here and now is that spiritual being, is that eternal being. So there's a difference between between eternal and eternity. And eternity is something that just repeats for, forever and ever and goes on forever. But eternal is without time. Eternal is completely without time. Joseph Campbell gives us that definition. And if we recognize then that we are already eternal, that we are here at this place having this having this, this space-time experience, but in fact, time doesn't exist. There's only the now. There is only the presence. If we can bring ourselves to remember that we are already immortal and we're never going to be more spiritual than we are right now. We may recognize more of our spirituality, but we're never going to be more of a spiritual being than we are right now. Then we can start living our life today and every day as the beautiful, immortal expression of God that we are. See, then we can start to see the miracle in the sunrise. We can sense the power in the sunset. And all of this, Dr. Holmes is telling us, is something that we, we will come to know of our own knowing. Not just because he said so, not just because I told you he said so, not just because <clears throat> people down the years have, have said so, but it is something that we come to experience through a knowing, not necessarily an intellectual, logical, rational knowing, but a knowing like an intuitive knowing, a knowing within. Kind of the, the, the flash of cosmic consciousness that Richard Maurice Buck talks about, the mystical or ecstatic experiences of the saints. Each and every one of us has those. Each and every one of us can sense this inner presence, this inner knower, this inner being, which is the presence of God within us. And that's what the Christ is. That's what we're going to talk about next week when we talk about Christmas. So what I invite, what I invite us to consider today, this week, as we're leading up to Christmas, is to just stop when you can. When you get out of bed in the morning before you go to sleep at night, when you can't during the day, and to remind yourself, I am already eternal. I am already immortal. I am already spiritual. This physical world that I see around me is nothing more than the perfect place in consciousness for me to discover my own immortality, my own spirituality. That consciousness has brought me here because this is the perfect place for me to be at this point in my spiritual evolution. And that consciousness will continue to take me to the perfect environment for my spiritual growth forever and forever and forever. That everything that I need is already here within me as the presence of God within me, as the consciousness of God within me. And as the wisdom, the omniscience of God could direct the power, the omnipotence of God to create this entire universe that we can see and all that we cannot see by simply its intention, 
that that power of God functioning as us can and does create in our circumstances and in our environment everything that is appropriate for our realization of our true nature, of our immortality, of our spirituality, of the Christ within. So I invite you this week, let's go forward as the immortal beings that we are. Let's go forward as the spiritual beings that we are. Let's cast aside the ideas that our culture has given us about life needs to be difficult and then when you die there's going to be a pass-fail test Let's recognize that what we are is a beautiful, unique, individualized expression of God with perception, with memories, with personality. And that shall continue. And it shall continue to discover more and more of the divine within. Let's be that experience of love that we came to be. And when we leave here, let's remember that that's what we are to continue to be wherever we go. And so it is.